Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful tech leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode was brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Welcome everyone, Karolina Todt speaking, and this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast. Today, my guest is John Ford. He's um, worked at many companies like Vodafone, Philips, or GE, but right now he is the VP of Engineering and Site Leader at LogMe in Hungary. Welcome, John. Thanks very much, Karolina. I'm very proud and uh, happy to be your guest today. Thanks for joining us. Please tell us a bit about um, yourself and what you do, what your passions are. Okay, so you can probably tell that I'm English. I've been living in Hungary uh, since 2006. I actually have dual nationality. I'm Hungarian as well now. Uh, this was my workaround for the Brexit project that has been ongoing for a while. My job really, well, my career has been IT in every way, shape or form. Um, I started coding when I was about 10 or 11 years old. I had a bit of a break when I went to university. I actually studied languages at Oxford. I got my bachelor's and master's. Uh, I traveled around a bit. I worked in uh, Italy, lived in Italy for a bit and met my wonderful Hungarian wife. And that's what I'm doing here in Hungary. But in the meantime, we did live for about 10, 11 years on the south coast of, the, of, of England in the UK. Career-wise, so I've worked for a, a lot of companies. I've done, you know, IT projects, um, configuration consultant, operations management for small companies, startups, but probably mainly for large enterprises. The last 10 years or so, I've been setting up tech centers in Budapest. This is my fourth one that I'm currently growing, building, running. Uh, LogMeIn probably doesn't need any introduction to anyone from Hungary. It's uh, very well known on the local market. It's probably the most successful Hungarian startup or one of the most successful Hungarian startups, uh, certainly in the software area. And uh, we have a, a large team of great people developing, delivering and supporting SaaS native work from anywhere solutions. I guess is the shortest way to explain it. Awesomeness. Thank you. And I, I hope a lot of people who are not from Hungary also know LogMe. And, and so we can go from there. Dearest listeners, if you have not heard about LogMe, and this is your opportunity to go and check it out on the wonderful world of the internet. Today, our topic is how to turn around underperforming teams. And I think it would be very beneficial if we could start by defining what an underperforming team looks like, in your opinion. Yeah, so that's probably the key first step is to find out whether your team really is underperforming. So usually there's quite a lot of opinions out there and uh, you need to check you know, with a few stakeholders and kind of triangulate the perspective on the team. Obviously, talk to people within the team. The team leader is likely to defend his people. Often, particularly, well, in any area of IT delivery, but especially in software engineering, there's a lot of pressure to deliver more. Um, so expectations are usually quite high. So you need to check from various people, uh, some of the context, some of the background, if you're inheriting the team. In particular and I guess my preferred way is to look at data you know look at some team performance look at maybe some appraisal ratings for members of the team look at attrition numbers over the previous six months or so but also look at kind of if you have the data to hand the velocity of delivery and how much value that is seen to be generating. So how much is the team delivering? How much is the team releasing to production? And are they working on the right stuff? So are they kind of being pushed by a particular stakeholder to the detriment of 
other priorities, try and get that triangulation. And I guess it's worth saying as well that I value diversity within a team. So I don't just mean, you know, gender or racial diversity. I mean, having different people in the team. Probably the worst thing I could imagine is having a team full of people who are just like me, because we wouldn't get a great deal done. You know, you need your kind of sociable person. You need your stand up and tell you why it's not going to work person. You need the detail obsessed person. You need the ideas person, the executor. And uh, so sometimes people don't particularly like people who are not like them and they might accuse them of not performing. So you need to get a kind of objective reality check on these things. How nice. It sounds like you are very much a data-driven guy. I try to be. <laughs> so, so if we are looking at all these numbers, what are some of the exact signs? I don't know, like, is there a, a perfect velocity under which you have to pay uh, attention? So the short answer is no. It depends on the situation. But to answer your question, I think you can look at the allocation of effort across the team, because there are kind of four or five things that every software engineering team needs to work on. Uh, one is obviously delivering new features, but those features could be functional uh, customer facing features, or they could be technical improvements, which are maybe not obvious to the users, but are just as important. You will inevitably, unfortunately, always get defects, uh, either from testing or in production. So you will need to work on maintenance, support, and uh, probably within that bucket, you know, there's training activities, there's knowledge transfer, there's bringing new people on board. So there's a whole maintenance side of things. Unless you're working on very much the brand newest technology, you will also incur technical debt as time goes by. So tech debt is not necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of like getting old. It's inevitable. But for one reason or another, and it might be a deliberate decision to cut some corners in order to launch a new product on the market quicker. Or it could be that technology has changed over time. Uh, some of my products are quite old. If you have a code base that's 10, 15 years old originally, some things like maybe video components or media platforms uh, change, and maybe you just haven't quite got around to spending the engineering effort to um, to swap those components out. All these things are tech debt. Now, the problem is that tech debt tends to get neglected because the business don't want to hear about you tidying up your own house. They don't kind of want engineering to spend time on doing stuff which isn't necessarily going to benefit the customer, might not increase sales. But if you do continue to neglect technical debt, you will eventually start slowing down significantly. Your support burden will probably go up. So you'll actually be spending more of an overhead on support and maintenance. And so, um, you know, sales, marketing, product, and the end customer will eventually suffer. And if you let it go completely unchecked, it can be absolutely crippling. So as a general rule of thumb, I'd say kind of 20%. And this come up, oh, so 20% of your time should probably be spent on paying down tech debt. And this is, you know, a day a week, basically, for a software engineer. And this is kind of a benchmark that comes from lean thinking, where some lean practitioners and leaders would say that the activities involved in improving your work are actually more important than doing the work itself. Which is like, yeah, you know, it's a bit like practicing a musical instrument. The more you practice, the better you can play. No one really wants to put in all that effort in practicing, but you know that if you do, you'll be better at when it comes to performing. So I'd say the benchmark for tech debt is about that. Uh, support can vary from 15 to 30%, which leaves kind of 50, 60% for new features. 
which is less than most people would want like to hear to admit to yeah and then the other thing which particularly um in these days where we've all shifted to remote working and we're basically all working in the cloud the other really serious thing that can drop off the radar is security governance risk compliance making sure that um your solution provides integrity confidentiality availability can't be hacked you know so you might be chasing iso 27001 compliance you might need other certifications but security is another area that's kind of not particularly attractive to the ears of a lot of your stakeholders but should not be neglected so we work on like 5% continuous allocation but if we have an audit coming up or a recertification then sometimes we have spikes where it might go up to you know 7 10%. Wow, lots of uh, great insights there. I hope everybody is paying very close attention. So, and correct me if I am wrong, I am hearing quite a few things. First of all, that the team doesn't necessarily have to just be working on new features all the time even though that's the kind of sexiest thing to do and so when it comes to very well performing teams that probably means that they are doing some of the things that are just pure grunt work that you have to do to to kind of stay afloat like refactoring the code base and supporting the customers or supporting the business side of things making sure that you're aligned with um whatever the business is asking you to do but also aligned with your own values of having a responsive code base or or having um things that are kind of adhering to the clean code principles or whatever it may be so if this is how we define a very well performing team what are some of the reasons that engineering teams aren't living up to their potential Right. So that's a good question and um the way I envisage a well-performing team is like a well-oiled machine that can go fast, can go slow. So one thing I've done all my life is ride motorcycles. And um I have a couple of motorcycles at the moment, but one of them is a Ducati Monster 821 and I really like it. It's very flexible. So obviously it can go very fast. and I won't tell you in public how fast uh, I've managed to get it to go but it can also go extremely slowly so my record so far I think is 3 kilometers an hour which is below walking pace without putting my feet down so I would say a well-oiled engineering machine should be able to go fast for short periods if necessary should be reliable doesn't break down shouldn't need too many oil changes refueling etc you should be in control doing all the things required even if some of those things are kind of invisible you know so my motorbike is a is a good metaphor for that i think if a team is not performing so if you've ascertained that the team is not performing there are three areas that i like to break it into and these have sort of consistently been a good way for chunking up uh, a problem for me at least and that is in order of importance people process technology are your most important thing you know you get motivated talented engaged capable people working well together and the sky's your limit you can do all sorts of things but if your people are not engaged or just technically not good enough or they don't really care or they're fighting each other and they're not working together as a team even if they might be superstars individually for any of these reasons that will really hold you back so as a leader you need to identify pretty quickly whether there are maybe people who were hired wrongly maybe in the wrong role maybe with the wrong skills and in my experience there are usually a few people who really just need to get off the bus. So um that's pretty I, harsh. I, 
Yeah, but, you know, they get other opportunities elsewhere. So I picked up one team which was badly underperforming, and out of, like, 10 people, I think I got rid of two pretty quickly. So it's not open heart surgery. And the funny thing is that the rest of the team will thank you for it usually because they kind of know who the free riders are. What was your method for discovering who were the two people you you wanted to um, say goodbye to? So talking to them, you know, get a feel for what's the attitude. Personally, I don't like arrogant people. So if someone thinks they know everything, then they obviously don't because no one can. So, you know, that th this is a kind of alarm bell looking at what they've done, what they haven't done, how much work is in their backlog, how easy or not easy that work is, you know, what could they just be knocking off? How are their relationships with stakeholders? Are they okay to work with or, or not? You know, so some kind of human interaction problems. But then there's another area which I mentioned is engagement. And this is where the leader can do a lot. So just with people, I think open, honest, transparent communication, where obviously there's some things that you can't tell, but don't hold information back. Make people realize that if they come to you with something confidential, you're not going to pass it on. And make sure that there's a level of trust that gives them a psychological safety net to come to you and, and share things. Obviously, you don't want to be the agony aunt and you don't want to listen to everyone's problems. But on a professional level, they need to be able to trust you and you need to show that you've got their back, you know, of your people. So putting in place that level of trust can drive engagement quite high. Then the next step on the people side is empowering. So Some leaders get to the position where they were basically just the best technical person or for some reason they've got to a position which maybe they're holding on to stuff that they probably need to let go of. A while ago, I think it was about 2002, <laughs> so it was a while ago, I'm showing my age now, I kind of made the decision to move away from technology specialist, so away from the technical track to the management leadership track. And because technology changes so much, you're never going to be able to keep abreast of all the developments and maintain the same level of knowledge over the years if you're not doing technical activities all the time. So you need to kind of let it go and delegate those activities, find the best people for those activities, and then empower them, trust them, delegate them to do this stuff instead of creating a bottleneck yourself by being that bottleneck. And then empowerment goes a lot further. You know, you need to let people make decisions for their area, give them clear guidelines, clear frameworks, You know, so this is your scope. This is out of scope. It's a bit like with children. And then just let them do their job. Because most people, there's a little video on uh, YouTube by a guy called Dan Pink about motivation for software engineers. And I think he's dead right. It's like right. finding some purpose, having a degree of autonomy, and then just trying to do the very best you can. And most people want to learn and grow. Most people want to do a good job. So if you give people a degree of autonomy within their work and then support them to improve and let them get on with it, and, you know, if there's a purpose there as well. I mean, LogMeIn has very much found a purpose during this global coronavirus pandemic where we are keeping thousands and thousands of companies afloat and enabling them to work remotely with all their people, control their devices in a safe, secure way, enabling conferencing and communication. So, you know, that purpose is great. If you want to work for a cigarette company, that's your choice. But, you know, <laughs> purpose is the cherry on the cake, I think. Right. It's the 
the guiding star oh my god really just like lots of great stuff i'm just sitting here just like nodding like yeah that's right when you decide whether or not you are gonna take a team or switch to a new a new role what kind of information do you consider to make your decision do you kind of look at whether or not the team that you are about to take is performing well or isn't performing well so i don't usually look at that i mean usually you accept the role but you don't really know your team because you have a bunch of interviews with managers etc it's said that people go to work for people so you know obviously you look at the company etc but i can tell you when i had all the rounds of um interviews around about this time last year at log me in i met some really great people and uh, it's kind of the quality of the people um, in that leadership team that attracted me to the company i did my research and the company was kind of providing uh, building software in the right area but you don't really know your team until you've taken the role so we covered some of the people aspects and how to sort of ascertain whether the team seems to be underperforming there's a, a theory in lean thinking that it's the process and the system that holds people back rather than the people so the second pillar is looking at processes and sometimes and i'm sure people out there who work for large enterprises will recognize the situation where some of the internal processes are so heavy and so slow that it makes people look as if they're taking a long time to do their job even though they're kind of kicking against the machine and trying their hardest and pulling their hair out and putting lots of effort in you know so typically these might be procurement processes getting financial approval for something recruitment processes, opening positions, getting new hires signed off. These things can take an age, especially in large enterprises. So sometimes you have to look and basically start with the man in the mirror. So check within your own scope, are there processes where people are being held back that are maybe delaying things without adding value? So a litmus test might be, okay, this approval step you know so like as a manager i get lots of approvals and sometimes i think what would happen if i said no to this so if i'm hiring someone for my team why does the approval come to me because obviously i want that person so it's quite funny i would never say no when i'm basically the one who kicked it off so that's a kind of non value added step in uh, lean parlance and it's not business non value add because it's not a necessary step it's just waste So if there's any parts of the process where items are sitting in working process without actually kind of having value added to them then probably that needs to be streamlined. So there's a process side to a team because a team doesn't sit in isolation. Right. Would you say a few words to that uh, some people especially while they are not as skilled or as experienced in their roles perhaps need more processes to kind of hold them i don't want to say accountable but hold them in safety as so that they are doing the right things um while maybe more senior colleagues who know the ropes and have the most experience within the team are the people who are held back by the processes Yeah, potentially. So if we think about software engineering processes, so rather than, you know, financial approval where there's a bigger picture where someone needs to know that we're keeping within our budget, you know. But if you think about software engineering, you should have checks and balances in place. I think I read somewhere, it's maybe even a Google maxim that the statement is even the most junior person should be able to deploy to production. and the reason is because you know they have the checks and balances in place so maybe they have an automated test suite that at the point of deployment basically checks automatically that there's nothing that's going to break the system 
so that kind of process is uh, is adding value so it's a self-secure process yeah kind of. i mean another example might be something like the end of sprint readout to stakeholders so we could just say yeah we're done we've met all the requirements we've released it but to get the kind of buy-in from all your stakeholders and to demonstrate the progress that you're making and the value that engineering is delivering that even a short demo of working software is really great to show that you know we're done we're ready this is what you're getting maybe you've reduced the scope slightly because some items weren't finished in time to be released so this is a process step that you're not it's not just an agile ceremony it brings value by aligning people showing them what you're doing what you're delivering um, aligning their expectations this is a, another example of a, a process step that brings value in my mind right right so we have talked about a lot we talked about people and we talked about processes and we somewhat touched on the technical readiness of the individuals And you also said if you see that some people are not the best fit for the team, sometimes you, you need to let them go. If somebody is listening to us who kind of feels like their team isn't performing in the best way possible, what is your advice for them to do as an engineering manager? Okay, so I've talked probably most at the beginning about inheriting a new team. I think I probably covered that. Uh, the only advice would be keep an open mind because there might be reasons. You know, so what you've seen before in your experience, there's more than one way of doing things. There's a company culture, a history to the team. So, you know, just keep an open mind. I think if you have been the leader of a team for a while and the team's performance is dropping off, there might be a uh, lack of clarity around the high level objectives for the team. So you might need to link uh, the strategy for uh, the product or for the company, or at least the objectives of the next level up from you or even two levels up. Link that to kind of the reality of what the team is seeing and doing, and also probably provide some direction and focus around what are the strategic objectives. So, you know, the easiest way is kind of what's important for my manager? What are the team doing that's kind of moving towards those objectives? And what are they doing that aren't? And why are they doing that? But there might be really good reasons for why people aren't necessarily working on what should be a strategic priority. So we didn't really touch on the third pillar, technology. I talked a little bit about technical debt. I guess in the past, I've been a very big fan of standardization, consolidation, rationalizing an enterprise portfolio. I think this is maybe sort of, you know, the uh, maybe the previous age of IT software. <laughs> so now I think we're more in kind of the end user drives the solution. So if anything, the landscape is going to be more and more heterogeneous because, you know, now users can go and install an app, whereas 20 years ago, you know, it was an executive decision to purchase a new enterprise system or something. But whatever happens, if you have kind of a huge number of different software solutions or you know, maybe tools which are, have overlapping functionality, that level of complexity just slows down the team. And particularly, you know, there are other ways to measure complexity, not just the number of tools, but maybe the seriousness of the requirements going through the tools. There's multiple ways to kind of figure out whether your environment is not just too complex for the team to get their heads around. And software engineers are very smart people, but there's no point putting extra obstacles in the way. So that's where technology can get in the way. Also, you might be kind of working on similar types of products. Maybe some of them are more legacy than others. At LogMeIn, we have some remote control and 
remote support solutions with very large blue chip customers, but quite old code bases. And they're delivering a lot of revenue, you know, hundreds of millions, but some of the technology and some of the functionality is overlapping. So my advice would probably be look across the architecture and look across some of the components, see if you can reuse some components. Uh, last year, for example, we developed a new product called Live Lens, which is basically a camera sharing solution for providing remote support. So if the support service agent is working remotely and the, com and the customer is in their own home, like we all are these days during COVID, then through camera sharing functionality, the service agent can direct the end user, the customer, exactly what to do on a piece of equipment, like their vacuum cleaner, for example, and how to fix it, even though you're both working from home. So this is a kind of camera sharing component that we can take out and reuse in other products, swapping out maybe more legacy architecture and rationalizing the number of technical components that the teams need to support. So that basically takes technical burden off one team. And it was probably, you know, old legacy architecture, which probably wasn't very interesting for them anyway. And in, a, in the technology pillar kind of frees them up to work on stuff, which is hopefully building their skills more, providing more motivation, probably a bit more purpose whilst sustaining the revenue generation of that product. That's an example in, in that area. It kind of sounds like when you are talking about the technicalities and when you're talking about the team, that in both cases, the leader needs to either maintain some sort of a distance or has to be able to consciously, mentally step back and, and look at kind of the underlying structures or the bigger picture of either thing, the, the team or the product? Yeah, I think so. I think you have to kind of trust the people coming out of college these days, you know, they should have been taught agile development methodology and kind of the right way to do stuff, at least in theory. So back to the motorbike example, have your hands on the handlebars enough to make sure that it's going in the right direction. But people do like to be in control of their own destiny. So you do need to be able to step back. And I guess another thing that's worth saying is that, you know, software engineering is probably one of the most complex activities known to man. And it devolves, and women, and it involves an awful lot of concentration, focus, really deep focus. So every time you as a manager or a team leader go and interrupt someone, it takes them a long time to get back into the zone. You know, it's not like, you know, working on a production line in a factory where someone can turn around and have a word with their supervisor and then get back to making things. You know, it takes a probably if you're disturbed, distracted, if you have to switch context, um, it can it can take um, quite a lot of time to get back in the zone and get back up to productivity. So as a leader, I try not to disturb people too much. So as an example, I try not to organize too many all hands or global conference calls, unless there's really something to say, because you're basically, you're not just taking the time of all those people, you're also taking their concentration and you're distracting their attention from their real work because, you know, engineers can do a lot of stuff. You know, we can fill in Excel spreadsheets, we can write Word documents, and we can code. And loads of other people can do the spreadsheets and the Word documents, but they can't code. So we really should leave engineers to code because they're the only ones who can do that. You know, and if, if anything, try and take that other stuff away from them so that we let them get on with what they're being paid for at the end of the day. It's a nice way of uh, putting that. So what's your what's your rule of thumb for getting in touch with, with the software engineers? So we talked about, you know, like making sure that they know where the product or the project is going. They know the company 
perspectives and they know how they are aligned with their their own goals and how they are one useful part of a bigger machine if we are back to the Ducati example but um, when do you make sure that they know all these things how often can you disturb them with such information I'm putting disturbed in air quotes here Yeah, so I try and run like a quarterly all hands, so once every three months. But obviously things change during that time. You know, I try and schedule the cadence so that it's just after any of the sort of business all hands. So if a global CEO does a quarterly all hands, I make sure that mine is a couple of days after. So that if there's anything um, that's relevant to software engineering, You know, I can try and explain that and try and put it through a filter and and make things relevant to their world, or rather our world. But at the same time, I have like a very much an open door policy because it's kind of, okay, we're all working remotely now, but it's in the one-to-one conversations, uh, it's over a cup of coffee in the kitchen that you find things out. Uh, people are unlikely to say stuff in an open meeting, particularly software engineers who tend to be slightly introverted anyway. And then I guess there's certain messages which actually go both ways, you know, so there's certain messages to take from the engineering team to teams outside of engineering. To give an example, someone who might be rushing to deliver new features for a large customer needs to understand that if we haven't tested them properly, if it hasn't gone through the right kind of environment of, you know, test and deploy, then there might be issues in production. So we're not trying to be obstreperous in engineering. We're not trying to delay the process. We need to explain and communicate that. And I need to kind of, so in my role, I'm kind of like the interpreter in between because I understand the technical reasons, but I can formulate that and communicate that in kind of business ways and business speak which hopefully will hit the mark. I'm sure they, it usually does, because otherwise you wouldn't be in the position that you're in. Um, <laughs> so we are about to reach the, the end of our conversation. And I'm just wondering if there is a story that you could share with our listeners where you used the tools, the tricks and tips and successfully or unsuccessfully, if it's a more interesting story, turned around an underperforming team into one that reliably and happily is performing well. Yeah, okay. So the one that springs to mind is a team that I inherited. I used to work for a company in the UK. Then I left this company for a few years and went back in a different role, a more senior role as a managing technical architect. But within a couple of weeks, word had got round about who I used to be, what I used to do. And so I was brought in to basically turn around a team that was doing exactly what I had been doing a few years before. So I was like, okay, you know, it's a kind of short term project. I got on to the client side because this was a global consultancy. And uh, I made quite good connections with, you know, the customer, the customer management, the um, basically technical representatives from the customer. Very funny story is that uh, I rode my motorbike to work every day. The first day on the job, it was absolutely pouring with rain. This was in England and I turned up soaked. So my shirt sleeves were soaking wet. And this was how I shook the hand of the client manager. And he looked at me and said, uh, what's happened? I said, well, I ride a motorbike and it was really bad weather today. And he said, no way, I ride a motorbike as well. Wow, kudos to you for coming in on such a bad day. And he was really impressed purely by the fact that, purely by that. So that was a good start. Then he mentioned that this team was not performing, well, was basically not delivering, was way behind. So I asked to see like the issues log, the scope of work, their backlog, what they were working on, how overdue each item was. 
And it did look pretty bad. You know, it was all totally red. So then I talked to uh, the team leader and various other people on the team. Uh, the team leader was a very nice guy, but not really very strong as a character. There was another character who was very strong, but not particularly capable, probably less technically capable than the team leader, and certainly much less nice. And then there was another guy who was a third party contractor, very expensive, and really not delivering. I sat down with him quite a lot. After discussing all the things he was working on and why they weren't being finished, my end conclusion was that the guy's just lazy. He's basically being well paid and basically not delivering. And because he was a contractor, he was one of the people who I moved off the team. So actually, he was the only person I moved off the team, which saved money. And instead, I brought in a guy who I used to work with the few years before when I was at this company before he was still there. We knew each other. I said, Tim, what are you doing? What are you working on? Are you available? And he said, Oh, you know, yeah, I'm available. So I brought him in as um, kind of technical support for the team leader. The team leader was a really nice guy, not very strong technically. Tim, very, very, very strong technically, a bit of an introvert, but he could support the team leader. So that was the people side. I sort of then relentlessly followed the data. So looked at each issue, each um, item on the backlog. Where are we? How much work is it? What are the options? Looking at the relative priority with the uh, customer manager and making sure that the team focused on just delivering one of the options for each of the most important issues, starting with the most important and keeping time as the main driver. So if we're late on a couple of not very important things, then that's fine, but get the big rocks in the glass first. And anyway, long story short, we went from uh, totally red to totally green and we were on time and uh, we had a big kind of company do and this team ended up, we all won a glass, a bottle of champagne for being the most successful team. <laughs> so. I think the C CIO of the company described it as some sort of miracle. <laughs> How awesome. Yeah. You make it sound so easy. It's not easy. So the people is the hardest bit. People are complex, more complex than IT systems. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a nice thing to to conclude on. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners? No, I guess not. I mean, I'm, I'm open for feedback. So if anyone hears this, um, has some questions or feedback, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to ping me. Let me know that you heard the podcast. And yeah, thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we leave, I just have one question that is really bugging me. So I will ask linguistics you know like i am a cognitive scientist i studied lots of linguistics uh, back in college and uh, i can see how it's your like your interest area still but i am just curious about the the story behind it you know like how did you make the change to linguistics and then back to software engineering yeah so quite often i get asked this and uh, I guess the way I see it is that it's basically pretty similar, you know. So if you think I was writing programs in basic before I learned a foreign language. So I was 10 or 11 and I started doing French when I was 12, I think. And, you know, you can't make any mistakes when you're programming. You have to get the syntax exactly right. There are expressions, um, there's almost description, adjectives, classes, and um, characteristics of a class. You can't use your hands to gesticulate and uh, convey the meaning. It's basically a language. Now, when I was programming in BASIC, um, I only had 16K RAM on my ZX Spectrum. 
So I soon had to move to assembly language where you're dealing with, you know, 1001101, and you're like writing numbers in hex or something. So the language analogy soon went out the window. But then I went and studied languages, came back, and technology had completely changed. But the necessity of translating business requirements into technical options, whether that's configuration options or uh, coding, that translation element remained, and it still remains, you know, because you're effectively taking a business domain and you're translating it into a set of commands for a machine to deliver value in that domain. So I think it's actually quite similar. It's quite interesting because my daughter is now studying languages at university here in Hungary. And uh, she's doing ling German linguistics, which I also took as a side subject as part of my degree. And at the same time, one of our solutions, one of our uh, products at LogMeIn uses NLP, natural language processing, to basically power an AI chatbot and uh, help with customer self-service effectively, so AI-assisted service online. And so discussing NLP with my daughter over dinner, you know, these are the kind of things we talk about, it's amazing how when you're looking at kind of 3D vectors to basically get to a semantic representation for the chatbot, it's amazing the similarities to the NLP that actually we studied as a very, very small part of our linguistics part of our university degree. Right. So it's like the circle has come has come full round. That's <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this story. And thank you for joining us. Dearest listeners, be sure to follow John on Twitter or LinkedIn. Today, my guest was John Ford, VP of Engineering and Site Leader at Logme in Hungary. Thank you for joining us. I am Karolina Tóth, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com. <laughs>